Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, uh, thank you for American Decency for having me out here. What I would like to do is I'm going to go through a, a series of briefings, a, a series of slides on the interfaith delusion. One of the things I realized is whenever we would see a political issue really start to brew up, a, a brotherhood, the Brotherhood would call for a uh, get-together at their Islamic Society Center and bring politicians there. And of course, people would go to raise the question with a politician why they're working with them. And lo and behold, there would always be a minister, a priest, and a rabbi right there. And the unstated thing is if you are going to challenge the Brotherhood, they're not going to respond to you, those people will. And so the question kept coming up to me, and we can bring those slides up when you're ready. The question came to me, how is it possible that this works like clockwork? And of course, um, I did information operations in the Pentagon, and, and I did uh, other things like that. You, you start to realize there's something going on here, and I started doing some research, and, and lo and behold, I found it. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start moving to these slides. I will kind of stand off to the side and actually read my own slides because it's somewhat textual in a way. What I want to do is I'm going to talk about some things. We'll go through some quotes from the Quran. We'll go through some quotes in the Bible. And I, I'm not telling people to put aside their faith, but the, the, when we go through these quotes, I'm not asking you to make a faith determination. I'm going to make the argument there's a logic attack, a logic attack going on, and look at it from that perspective. This is this is is not intended to impact anybody's faith. It's not expected to do anything. So that's how I, I really want to get people to look at this way. And the other part of it is when we talk about this interfaith attack, what's extremely important is the fact that really at the bottom of it, what happened is the Muslim Brotherhood realized sometime in the 80s, and you know I could get very specific about it, that Western civilization, America was going to be brought down by this left-wing narrative. And there, what they did was just join join in the whole whole effort. I like to show you this because I'm from Minnesota. I'm a Viking fan, and that's going to be the Vikings' new stadium. <laughs> I do that because I watched them do this. I would like to tell you my book is on sale. CSP Center for Security Policy, Frank Gaffney's group. They brought me on board. If I spend too much time over here, people over here tell me to wander over there, and I'll do that too. But I'm right-handed, uh, so there you can you can take a look at that. Here's a, here's a uh, paper, a document written by a couple people. What did they say? We, all four of us, were in senior positions in the U.S. intelligence community and should have been aware of the information until we briefed them, and we were not. Who signed that document? The Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, General Boykin. The Inspector General of the Department of Defense, Joe Schmitz. The Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General, um, uh, I just blanked out on his name. Soyster, General Soyster, and the former head of the CIA, uh, Woolsey. So the stuff we have briefed has been impactful even inside the intelligence community. We can, we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with people and, and know that we're going to walk away most of the time winning. So here we have uh, me and Pat Poole. We formed a 501 called uh, Unconstrained Analytics, and we have a web page if you ever want to take a look at it. And in 2007, I wrote a thesis for the National Defense Intelligence College. You have to be in the intelligence community and you have to be you know, a lot selected to attend this master's program. And for my thesis, I said, the cost of not understanding the enemy has been high and it's getting higher every day. It will be increasingly measured by the news stories that narrow in on a senior leader's inability to answer basic questions about the nature of the enemy. It will also manifest itself in official responses to terrorist attacks that become progressively less reality-based. Are we there? Are we there? I have it in writing in a thesis in 2007. I, you're not really supposed to quote yourself. <laughs> so this is, except that I just kind of want to lay down a couple things for people who might not have ever heard of me, that you know, I, I put stuff in writing and I end up converting. So I'd like to point out this, this document here. It's from a quote from Carlos the Jackal. Only a coalition of Marxists and Islamists can destroy the United States. I really want people to understand that that is not a theoretical statement. It's not kind of a thing where we kind of sort of see the same thing. You've got to understand the cultural, and cultural Marxist narrative to get us a grip on how the Brotherhood manipulates that. So the first thing I'd like to do is talk about the Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, because we're going to need to know that. How many people don't know who the Muslim Brotherhood is? How many people have never heard of the explanatory memorandum? Raise your hand. Okay. 
So I want to keep this really much on point because there is the explanatory memorandum. Can everybody see it? Can everybody read it? The only thing you really have to see in that picture is that it's been stamped as evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial, the largest funding terrorism case in history. And just so you know, they were all found guilty. What is it that there was the largest funding terrorism case in history and nobody knows what happened? Because it really was not that well reported. Well, to be admitted in the court of law, they translated, it's called the explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goals of the group and it was written in 1991 by a man named Akram. And in it they said, we are the Muslim Brotherhood and we run, capital I, capital S, the Islamic movement. If you ever see that word, Islamic movement, the translator just didn't know he was supposed to capitalize it. But it sounds like a generic phrase, it's a, it's a term of art. So what do they say? They say, the enable of, of Islam North America, be, meaning establishing effective and stable Islamic movement led by the Muslim Brotherhood, which adopts as Muslim causes domestically and globally, and works to expand the observant Muslim base, and aims at uh, unifying and directing Muslims' efforts. So we know that this document is the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were all found guilty. And of course, what's the main point of this explanatory memorandum? Part four, the movement, meaning the Muslim Brotherhood, the Ikhwan, Islamic movement, excuse me, must plan and struggle to obtain the keys and the tools of this process in carrying out this grand mission as a civilization jihadist responsibility, which lies on the shoulders of Muslims and on top of them, the Muslim Brotherhood in this country. Now, I gave a brief to some people earlier today where we were talking about how this applies to state actors. What would you think if, just like most of our leading politicians, hang out with these people, so do most of our religious leaders? Understanding the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan, the Muslim Brotherhood, must understand their work in America as a kind of grand jihad in eliminating, destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believer so it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and work wherever he is and wherever he lands until the final hour comes. And there is no escape from destiny except for those who has slack off. Almost every one of those phrases is a paraphrase from the Quran. So do you think it's hard to understand what the Brotherhood's mission in America is? Do you think that it's staggering that whether it's uh, Republicans or Democrats, whether it's Catholics, Protestants, or Jews, these are the people who constitute the interfaith thing. And yet who they are cannot be any clearer. And this is a document that you could push back and say, but this was already admitted into a federal court of law. Don't tell me this isn't accurate. So let's take a look. You see that yellow scribbling in uh, Arabic down at the bottom? This, well, that says that, against them make ready. Please remember that phrase, against them make ready. What do you think it's referring to? It's referring to a quote from the Quran. Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others besides who you may not know, but whom Allah doth know. Wherever he shall, spe where, okay, good enough? Against them make ready? So. What you're understanding here is the role of the brotherhood is to prepare. Prepare what? Prepare for? War. Jihad. It is on their glyph. So uh, I like to argue there's a convergence between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. I've been arguing this for a while. It's in my book. <laughs> so let's take a look. From that document in Arabic and English, we see this phrase right here observant Muslim base. What organization have you ever heard of calls themselves the base? Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is the base. So here we have, and I ha I'm going to brush through here because there's something on top of this, which is why it's there. So here we have again, against the make ready, that quote, but take a look. Here's this document, and it's from the document. That's why you might have a hard time saying. It says, and prepare against them to the utmost of your power. Well, we're seeing it again, aren't we? Who wrote that? Well, that came out of the lone Mujahid pocketbook. Who, who published the lone Mujahid pocketbook? 
By the way, it came out two weeks before the bombing, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. Who do you think p published that book? Al-Qaeda in their Inspire magazine. How many people know that Al-Qaeda has been pub publishing a quarterly magazine in English since 2010 on what the, what, how, uh, in English. It's not translated, it's published in English. And what they do is they say, here's how you make bombs. That chapter in the magazine is called Build the Bomb in Your Mother's Kitchen. Of course, people laugh, but the point is how to build a bomb that law enforcement will not get their, will not register. And you know what? In this magazine, guess what one of the bombs was? A pressure cooker bomb, okay? And I think I have that somewhere. There's a pressure cooker bomb. So you see, Al-Qaeda is also saying, prepare against them, make ready. And of course, the Sarnaev brothers, the Chechen uh, jihadis, were very prominent at the Boston Islamic Society Mosque. So what we're doing here, they were all found guilty in the Holy Land Foundation trial, 108. Guilty, 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 times, you know, 108. So what we have here is at the back of that well, at the back of that document, admitted into a federal court of law, what we found is the list, their list of members from 1991. Who are they? They're ISNA. They're the Muslim Student Association. They're the North, Al North American Islamic Trust. Back then, it was called the ISNA Fiq Committee. They changed their name to the Fiq Council of North America. Same status, same orientation. You had the Islamic Association for Palestine. Things got hot because the Islamic Association for Palestine was Hamas. So what they did was they stood down the Islamic Association for Palestine. One of the directors flew the country, Marzuk, because he was wanted, because it's Hamas. And Hamas is a formally declared, excuse me, terrorist state. Hamas is also the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. Okay? It says it in Article 2 of the Hamas Covenant, we are the Muslim Brotherhood. Just watch counter-terrorist experts say, well, you can't confuse Hamas with the Muslim Brotherhood. And you look at them and you say, okay, we got that. Check. You know, another analyst who doesn't quite know the subject matter that he's briefing on. But then we have this. Oh, so when, when Islamic Association for Palestine went down, minus one of the founders of the IAP founded CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. We've all heard of them, right? Do you know in the interim between standing down the IAP, Islamic Association for Palestine, and creating CARE, their name in meetings was Sister Sama. And Sister Sama, Sama is Hamas spelled backwards. So then we have the Islamic Circle of North America. And finally, remember this at the very bottom. If I see my laser beam, it's just too attenuated. The Triple IT, the International Institute of Islamic Thought. Why do I want you to remember the triple IT? Because we're going to come back to the triple IT. So here we have Tariq Ramadan. Tariq Ramadan is the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. The founder of the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1920s was a man named Hassan al-Banna. And he went to Dallas, and, and he had this to say. We should all be very careful not to be colonized by something which is coming from this country or society. It should be us with our understanding of Islam, our principles, co po colonizing positively the United States of America. Does that sound like coming here just to get along? So I wanted to give that background on the brotherhood to start the interfaith delusion because, I, you know, the word interfaith gets used generically, but there's actually a formal movement called the interfaith movement. And I have a, I have a bet with him that I say watch for it and, and, and to see if we get a certain response. So first, what I'd like to do is talk about this book called The Quranic Concept of War. Anybody ever hear of it? Okay, take a look. The author is Brigadier General S.K. Malik of the Pakistani Army. But the, right underneath it, it says, a forward by General Zia al Haq, Chief of Staff of the Pakistani Army, who then became the head of state. Now, while General uh, Malik was on the, chief, was on the uh, Army staff at Pakis in Pakistan, he was allowed to write this book, which the chief of staff then said, I'm writing it forward. I want you to think about something. In an Islamic Republic, an Islamic army, the army chief, the army staff could not allow the general to title a book, The Quranic Concept of War, unless it was. Does that make sense? 
because if it wasn't, he wouldn't be allowed to title it that because there'd be issues of uh, apostasy. So what does this book say? Whoops, I hit the wrong button. What does this book say? Well, he comes down around page 60 or 70 and takes four quotes from the Quran. Let me read them to you. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Now, let me step back a second. How many people think the Quran is the equivalent of the Bible? The, the rough equivalent of the Bible, typologically. It's not. The, the, equiv- the, 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 the Christian or Jewish equivalent of the Quran would be the Ten Commandments. Because the Quran, all of it, is considered the uncreated word of God. So when a statement comes out of the Quran and you use the word interpretation, you're just wrong. Okay? And if you want to use the word interpretation, the range of interpretation is what the lawyers would call super strict construction. Because it's the word of God. You don't get to play with it. Okay? So we are, when we're reading something from the Quran, that's the uncreated word of God. And if it's a command and you violate it, you're committing a major sin called shirk in Islam. So let me reread again. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will still tear into the hearts of the unbelievers. Then, soon shall we cast terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Then, and those are the people of the book who aided them, Allah did take them down from their stronghold and cast terror into their hearts, so that some you slew and some you made prisoners. And he made you the heirs of their lands and their houses and their goods of a land which you had not frequented before, and Allah has power over all things. This verse is associated with Muhammad and his army going in and conquering the Bani Quraysh, where the Bani Quraysh unilaterally surrendered before hostilities, so there was no casualties, and what he did, some you slew, all adult males, any male with pubic hair, some you made prisoners, the women and the children, and that's exactly, exactly, let me say it a third time, exactly what ISIS is doing. Okay? And they're quoting this, and they're exactly correct. Okay? So, and now remember, let not, remember we've already had this quote twice? Yet again, the Pakistanis. Let not the unbelievers think they can get the better of you. They will never frustrate them. Here it is. Against them, make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies and others besides, and others besides whom you do not know, but whom Allah doth know. So let's take a look at those final two quotes. Going in and attacking the people, some... Some you slew, some you... Does this look like it's defensive warfare? Or is this outright conquest? Okay? Outright conquest. Okay? Some you knew and some you don't and all of those rest. That sounds like the 82nd Airborne's kill them all, let God sort them out. So when you hear someone say there's nothing in the Quran that says it, it's not just that it says it, but we have the players quoting it. Okay? We have the players in America quoting it. So, here we have it. What else does this book say? Terror struck into the hearts of the enemy is not only a means, it is an end in itself. Once a condition of terror into the opponent's heart is obtained, hardly anything is left to be achieved. It is the point where the means and end meet and merge. Terror is not a means of imposing decision upon the enemy. It is the decision we wish to impose upon him. We're going to use terror to terrorize you. The goal is for you to be terrorized. That's not an accident. So, from this la- we're almost done here. Terror cannot be struck in the hearts of an army by merely cutting its lines of communication, depriving of its route to withdraw. It is basically related to the strength and weakness of the human soul, the destruction of faith. See where we're going now? Psychological dislocation is temporary. Spiritual dislocation is permanent. To instill terror in the hearts of the enemy, it is essential in the ultimate analysis to dislocate his faith. An invisible faith is a means to terror. A weak faith offers inroads to terror. So do you understand that at first and foremost, as understood by a government, jihad is first and foremost the destruction of faith, spiritual warfare. And because doing spiritual warfare in the Department of Defense would violate all sorts of diversity guidelines, We don't even have a chapter on that. So you could say we're completely unclothed in the war of, uh, in the spiritual war. 
By the way, do, do you see that as we're doing all this stuff, people's faith is kind of getting shaken? So, we'll just go to this last quote. This rule is fully applicable to nuclear as well as conventional war. Is Pakistan a nuclear power? Are they on absolute record that they can justify nuclear attacks and further its jihad? How many people have said Islam would never allow WMD attacks? They will, they, they've been on, this book was written in 1978. So I like to set this up as a little, little talking point because now I want to go and hurt your mind a little before we go into the other, the main part of this brief. I call it it's all a matter of apples and oranges. I want to bring up a, th a concept of logic. It's so basic that in logic classes it doesn't get taught. Okay? And this is the, pardon? And in, in good logic classes, because it's assumed everybody knows it. It's the law of identity. If you are an apple, you are an apple. It's the law of non-contradiction. If you are an apple, you are not, not an apple. It is the law of the excluded middle. If you are an apple, you are not an orange. The entire attack on the West, the entire Marxist attack on the West, is to tell you that in everything, you could be an apple and an orange. You could be a man and a woman. You can be someone who believes in the New Testament and also believes in the Quran. You could be a Jew who believes in the Torah and believe in, in the Quran. You are being forced into a contradiction that causes the nihilistic collapse of faith by participating in the discussion. So I want to just go through the little, the little logic discussion here so you understand where I'm coming from. And it's going to be this logic analysis that we're going to use looking at the Bible next to um, the, the Quran. And for this point, my only point here, because I don't want people to think I'm trying to come up with a new hermeneutic, the attack is a logic attack. And you have to understand it. So, here we go. Here we go. This is the book, Interfaith Dialogue, A Guide for Muslims. It's put out by the International Institute of Islamic Thought, the Triple IT. And this book is about how they see the interfaith movement as being so successful at bringing down the mainstream Christian and Jewish communities in the West that they're just going to kind of ride along in spirit. How are they going to do it? They're going to force their members to obey their rules. So what are the rules? Dialogue must take place in an atmosphere of mutual trust. Well, that sounds okay, but there's also a sense in which trust has to be earned. And here's the point. This term is used, mutual trust is meaning if you trusted me, you wouldn't ask me serious questions or you wouldn't examine my religion. And you would take what I say at face value. Don't, don't take my word for it. Each dialogue partner has the right to define his or her own religion and belief so the rest can only describe what it looks like that to them from the outside. Therefore, your impression as on the issue is, is, is second tier. Make sense? It's second tier, and it doesn't count. Participants entering into dialogue must be willing to reflect upon themselves and their own religion. That means that while you cannot talk about my religion on this rule, I'm going to come at you because they're here to deconstruct you and your two bedwetting to try to do it to them. Practice fairness when speaking for or about other faiths. That's okay. I mean, speak in a way that people of that religion can affirm is accurate. You see, you can only talk about Islam and the interfaith movement in a way that they're willing to affirm. So all they have to do is say, this is not my religion, and you are compelled as the Christian or Jewish counterpart to agree. These are the interfaith rules which they didn't make. They're just holding people to them. Avoid misusing scripture by which he means that no one shall attempt to use one's own religion to dismiss another religion as invalid. Listen, this is, operates on two levels. You live in the United States where people have freedom of religion and people aren't about going about in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a legal way to invalidate people's religion. But it is necessarily the case that if you actually have a religion and you actually believe in the religion you have, you necessarily must think that it is correct and the other ones are not correct. Is that right? That's the law of identity. If you are an apple, you're an apple, and you're not an orange. If I get you to agree to that, you're saying you're an apple and an orange. Avoid misusing scripture. 
Well, I, I mean, here's the thing. If you're having a, a community get-together with everybody, all the churches, synagogues and, and, and uh, mosques, and you want to talk about a social issue, I, I get that. But that's not what this is about. This is about holding these rules about you and making this the higher rule that governs your faith. Again, the brotherhood didn't create this. They saw this, and they saw it was, it was driving down faith. And they said, we want some of that. Okay? So we're going to take a look at these two rules here. With the two rules in mind, let's look, let's look at what is never raised, that you cannot be allowed to raise, that cannot be refuted. And that is this. Let's take a look at those laws of reason, a review of the precursor phenom phenomena, what drives extreme relativism, postmodernism, everything's all relative. It's the logic attack, the law of non-contradiction along with its complement, the law of the excluded middle, the law of identity and reason. I think I've said this already, so I'll blast through it. Extreme relativism is a tyranny when apples are allowed to equal oranges. You see? The logic of it. An apple equals an apple, an apple equals an orange, and an apple equals its opposite. This is the postmodern attack on the, on the West. This is the whole thing behind the gender identity. To make you confused about something that any factual analysis will tell you is simply not, simply not true. As a, re, as, a, as a physical reality. And then imposing it. So here we are, the death of discernment. And I'm going to use where I live, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Northern Virginia. This is the interfaith group there, okay? And what do they say? It's Montgomery Action, uh, Action in Montgomery. It's their interfaith group. Ames, sister IAF affiliates in Maryland, and they name all their affiliates. If you could see better, almost every one of those URLs and emails have IAF in it. Who knows what the IAF is? I guarantee you, you will in about two minutes, and you'll be shocked. Even though you're prepared for it, you'll be shocked because you'll say it couldn't be this obvious. And my answer will be it was never not this obvious. So IAF is in all these email addresses. So who is the IAF? It's the Industrial Areas Foundation. There's the Industrial Areas Foundation. Who here has heard of the Industrial Areas Foundation? Okay. And what is the Industrial Areas Foundation? The Industrial Areas Foundation is a national community organizing network established in 1940 by Saul Alinsky. See? See? I said, I give this thing, and no matter how much people are ready for it, that comes up, and they go, oh. So, there it is. So, there's the IAF. AIM is an Alinskyist organization. And there you see there is the list of all the churches in the Montgomery County. And, of course, all the big players are, are represented. Okay? They're all on there. So, what else does it say? Reading list. What do you think is on the reading list? Huh? I keep hitting this button. It's just, well, there it is. You see it? You see Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. There it is. So what we have here is, this is his actual dedication. Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. So, you know, you should understand this about the Alinskyists, the cultural Marxists. At the end of the day, they're nihilists. At the end of the day, they'd rather be ruler in hell than subject in heaven. And I can quote it right out of his book. Really. By the way, Marx wrote a book called Quolith or something like that. It turns out Quolith, back in the 1840s, is an anagram that in German says Emmanuel. And that was understood in the time to be a satanic statement. And some people think that this statement here is not only 
uh, Alinsky's statement himself, but it's kind of an homage to Mark. So, so you cannot be an apple and not an apple. So let's take a look at how this goes. This thinking reflects the illogic of extreme relativism on the conflict of God. Are they substantive or are they superficial? So, from Deuteronomy, he has chosen you from all the nations on the face of the earth to be a people particularly his own. Or from the Quran, verse 564, the Jews say, Allah's hand is tied up, dot, dot, dot. Against them, we have placed enmity and hatred until the day of judgment. So you see, you could believe in the one, you could believe in the other, you could believe in neither, but you can't believe in both. So, from Exodus, you shall be my special possession. From a Hadith, a, say, a statement of the Prophet Muhammad, which is indirect divine revelation, considered an equivalent of the Gospels in its status, okay? The prophet said, the hour of judgment will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. It will not come until the Jew hides behind the rocks and trees. It will not come about until the rocks and trees say, O Muslim, O servant of God, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. You could believe in one. You could believe in the other. You could believe in neither. You can't believe in both. You see the contradiction here? So, and of course, from Genesis, the everlasting pact with Abraham. So, this is just from the. Uh, this is just something from the uh, Hamas covenant that says Article Seven calls for the killing of all the Jews based on sacred scripture, based on what Bukhari just said. So this is this is actually as real as it gets. So from Genesis, against them, again, again the Lord's messenger called on Abraham. I will bless you abundantly and make your descendants as countless as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Or th there is for you an excellent example to follow in Abraham and those with them when they said to their people, we are clear of you and whatever you worship besides Allah. We have rejected you and there has arisen between us and you enmity and hatred forever. But not when Abraham said to his father, I will pray for forgiveness. But praying for forgiveness is not in. So this is about enmity and hatred for forever that Allah is declaring against the Jews. You can't be an apple and an orange. You can't say that you, 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 you think both are, are valid. Because if you believe that, I believe you're not really clear about what you're thinking. Or I think that the, the belief you are representing is a little squishy in your own mind. Personally. So the Jews believe these men to be Jewish prophets. And so do Christians. Christians believe Jesus Christ to be Son of God, one of three in the Trinity. But Muslims believe these people are Muslim prophets. Muslim prophets. Okay? And there we have it. We have set the inspiration as we send it to Noah and the messengers after him. We sent inspiration to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, blah, blah, blah. Muslim prophets. So can a Jew believe this and still be Jewish? Can a Christian? So, one God, three Abrahamic faiths, same God. It's not even the same Abraham. So, here we will end up a couple quotes from the Old Testament. Anyone who will not listen to my words, which the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will hold accountable for it. But if a prophet presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded, or speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And of course, First Kings. Elijah approached the people and said, how long will you straddle the issue? I, I get in these discussions with people who are all in on the interfaith issue. How long are you going to straddle this issue? The Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer. I just, sometimes, because I'm kind of a secular guy, and I say, wow, this kind of hits it right on the nose, doesn't it? So, let's go to the New Testament. Matthew, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me, baptizing them in the, name of the Father and the Son and the, Holy, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. Or, please remember, I'm going to be quoting from Sora 5 almost every time. Chapter 5, book 5, and it's just the verses. Or, 
direct divine revelation. They do blaspheme who say Allah is Christ, the son of Mary, but said Christ, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever joins other gods with Allah, meaning Jesus, Allah will forbid him the garden and the fire will be his abode. So here you have that Allah is not saying that that's not true. He's saying he queried Jesus and Jesus is saying, I wouldn't say that. How about this from 2 Corinthians? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Or another, see it's 572. This is the very next verse. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all you. Or they do bless people who say Allah is one of three in the Trinity. And of course, they're going to have a grievous penalty, which will be falled on them. Or... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, look at this. Surah 572, 573, 575. Now, if you saw something like this lining up in the Bible, where it's like three times mentioned, would you see, think that that's the Old or the New Testament hammering it down? Now, here's something you may not know. Surah 5 is the last Surah of the Quran to speak about relations with non-Muslims. So it's the most authoritative. I don't want to go too far into Islamic law, but under Islamic law, the law of, of um, abrogation, five is the definitive one on relation with non-Muslims. Surah 9 is with jihad. So Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger. See how Allah doth make his signs clear to them, yet see in what ways they are deluded away from the truth. So we're going to revisit some of this wordplay because I think there's actually wordplay in here. So do you see, you could believe in one, you could believe in the other, you could believe in neither. You can't believe in both, okay? By the way, do you think, 10 minutes, we're good. So do you think the brotherhood knows that when they do this to the Christians and Jews? Do you think that when they go in the interfaith movement, they already went there because doing the Alinsky thing, they're already compromised? And do you think that they know that they're going to fold on this? You know, there's a part of me that thinks before you can go after the brotherhood in these interfaith movements, you have to go after the interfaith movement. As defined this way. So, the revelation of the one seeks to uh, deny the other. So, let's take a look. The two Jesus is side by side. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes from the Father except through me. Or, another verse from Surah 5. And behold, Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as gods in der derogation of Allah? He will say, glory to thee, I would never say what I had no right to say. When you hear Muslims say that this is the actual, what was actually revealed, remember, from their perspective, this is absolutely true. And because it's direct divine revelation, they cannot budge. We believe the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begot not made, one in being with the Father. Or, another Sora 5 verse, in blasphemy indeed are they who say that Allah is Christ the Son of Mary. See then hath, who then hath the least power against Allah? If his will were to destroy Christ, the Son of Mary, his mother, and every, and, and, and all every one of them on earth. I think that Allah wanted Muslims to know that Christianity is absolutely wrong in every way and completely incompatible with Islam. And I think Allah made the case. I don't have people, I don't have a problem with people doing interfaith in the situation of talking with people. I have a problem with them doing it and not knowing this because the very fact that they don't know it means that they're compromised and they're not even fit to engage in that discussion. But you see, remember, they can only say what the other side will validate. Make sense? Isn't this, isn't this sickening, sickeningly logical and sickeningly simple? That they're just saying, hey, you guys made a huge stick. We're going we're gonna to give it to you and beat yourselves with it. So at what point does the enforcement of a narrative approach denial of the truth? The all of Islam categorically denies all this. After all, if Matthew, 
John, 2 Corinthians, and Nicene Creed are apples, then those verses of the Quran are exactly not apples. But doesn't this mean that if one is the truth and the other is exactly not the truth? I mean, put yourself in the Muslim hands. If they really believe what they believe, they would think that they actually do have an obligation to shut you down. But if you actually believed what you believed, you would have an obligation to keep that from ever happening. And you wouldn't be wondering about that middle ground. The middle ground that only exists because you think you could be an apple and an orange. So, I want to show you something because I think this is intentional. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Behold, be on them. They are deluded away from the truth. And the Quran capitalizes the T word. The Jews call Uzair, son of God. I've talked to a lot of rabbis, and they don't know who Uzair is. So how do, we don't know what they're talking about. The Jews call Uzair a son of God, and the Christians call Christ the son of God. That is, that is a saying from their mouth. In this they are but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. All is cursed beyond them. They are deluded away from the truth. So you are either the way, the truth, or you're deluded from the truth. But whatever is the truth in Islam, they're telling you is exactly not that truth. So... almost like the, re, the uh, it was revealed to directly refute that, that line. So here we have it. And I think we'll pretty much wind it down right here. I write you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And, and know that no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father also. Does that mean something or doesn't it? And if it doesn't mean it here, one doesn't mean anything. And if you don't think it means it here, aren't you saying it's an apple and an orange? So, uh, let me back it up. At what point do you stop blaming the wolves, the jihadis, and start blaming the shepherd? Okay? What, at what point do you start holding the shepherds accountable? By the way, I'm not just talking about the interfaith. How about the FBI, who knew every one of the terrorists who struck recently, starting with um, Major Hassan, Anwar Awaki, the Sarnea brothers, the people down in Texas, Garland? They knew these people were terrorists. They didn't act. What about holding our people to the shepherd's standard? See, I just don't think, I think that if you're having an interfaith discussion, that's premised on any of this being true, I don't want to be a part of that discussion. I'm, I'll just say that. So I want to end with this bridging quote because I want you to cue your ears. And half of you, if you have ever come across with Steve, I know that that says it and it's different here. And I'm going to say, no. From Syed Kutub's book, The Milestones, this is the book that lays out the Brotherhood do uh, Doctrine more than anything else. He wrote it in 1966 while waiting to be executed. The chasm between Islam and Jahiliya is great, and a bridge is not to be built across it so that the people on two sides may mix with each other, but only so that the people of Jahiliya come, can come over to Islam. Anytime you're doing any outreach or something with the Muslim community and the word bridge comes in, or building bridges come in, there's a 100% probability that it's an influence campaign. And when you come and say, Steve, but this is different, I'm going to say, squared. Squared. Okay? That is the giveaway. And when you start seeing this, you will know. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to say, let's look at these rules, these interfaith rules, which the Brotherhood didn't write. They just said, these guys in this interfaith movement, if we hold them to their rules, if they held themselves to these rules, really, they actually don't believe in their underlying religion because they're saying the higher religion, the interfaith rules are more important. And that's just like saying they can be an apple and not an apple. Okay? Each dialogue partner has the right to define his or her own religion and belief so that the rest can only describe what it looks like to them from the outside. Really? 
At what point do we see ISIS kill Christians and wanting you to see it on TV and you understand that that counts for something? That you're not allowed to bring it up. Practice fairness when speaking for or about other faiths, speaking what speak in a way that people of that religion can affirm? Do you understand that denies your right to have a view? Do you understand the whole interfaith movement is about that? Because you then have to go into that process. Let's take the brotherhood out of it. You have to go into that process, suppressing your belief to move forward. So I would just like to say, this is the interfaith delusion. And I have this here because we briefed, I briefed the uh, um, uh, Orthodox group of people. I said, this would never happen in the Orthodox church. And boom. It's happening in every major denomination. It, it is. And I think people can see that they can see this not by what, who, who's doing it, but by the effects. I've given this briefing a couple times. I was down in Georgia, and I was down in Southern California, two different places, where ministers said, Steve, you know, we invited all these ministers to come. And they said, are they recording it? And we said, yes, we're recording it. Well, send it to us. Where they said, we're too afraid to come. But, you know, nobody told a person of the cloth they had to be a shepherd. But if you're a shepherd, you better, well, be a shepherd. Okay? And I think there's some pretty strong words about that. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I hope you found it interesting. <laughs>